Call well, the order of a regular meeting of Goodyear City Council, 3 March 2008. Uh, would you please join Vice Mayor Antoniak in the Pledge of Allegiance and invocation? Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Join me in prayer if you wish. Dear Lord, as we embark upon yet another chapter in our growth as a decision-making body, please shed light upon us and give us the strength, wisdom, and fortitude to make informed decisions representing the wishes and desires of our citizens of Goodyear and the greater Southwest Valley. Lastly, watch those men and women as they go about their duty protecting us, whether overseas or on the home front. And very lastly, please watch over our officer, Ricky Melrose, and his K-9 zip as they go through their recovery over the next several months. Amen. 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 Thank you. All council members are in attendance. We have no expenditures to ratify or approve. No communications. Opportunity now for any citizen from the public who would like to speak. Mayor, I have one speaker card. Okay, and it is on any subject not on this evening's agenda. Not on this evening's agenda. Okay. Eduardo Gonzalez. How are you doing? Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, my name is Eduardo Gonzalez. I'm a construction working a worker working for Great Western Erector. Uh, this is a company that installs a rebar and post tension, and it's right now installing the rebar on the spring train stadium. And uh, I was working with them. Uh, uh, this company is uh, very unjust. They, they they never have no drinking water available. They they uh, they put a, they they do not provide a, uh, security equipment. They don't give us no insurance. They make us work in dangerous situations. And uh, and uh, I'm we're looking for support from the city of Goodyear to stop this injustice that is happening in Great Western, and especially because uh, they're building the stadium that is be being built with the public money. And we would like for you guys to to set us some type of a, a meeting with Great Western to to handle all these things that are happening in their company that they're what they they're doing. Uh, and that's pretty much what I have to say. I just wish and hope that you guys understand that this is a very bad company, and uh, and I hope we can get an appointment with them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Raul, could you help us respond to that? Mayor Council, uh, this is actually the first time I've heard of any issues in our project, so we'll go ahead and address those. But uh, although I sympathize with their frustration, staff does not support or recommend getting involved between the uh, business of an employee and their employer. And I believe I've already submitted a white paper or an email to you all explaining the reasons. Uh, in my meetings with these individuals, I've recommended they take their complaints to the appropriate boards or agencies. This includes the Labor Board, OSHA, and others. In regards to their complaints, again, this is the first time we've heard of any allegations or any complaints in our project, so we'll go ahead and investigate those as quickly as we can. Uh, our staff, our field staff, they've been asked to be watchful of any potential issues, and we have not heard of any until this, this evening. And again, these gentlemen have the right to protest, and we will make all necessary accommodations to allow them, and also to allow them to do that without impacting our projects or impacting the public. So I'll talk to these gentlemen after the meeting and try to see what the actual issues or complaints are on this project. Are you able to address them in their native language? Excuse me? Are you able to yes, address them? Yes, yes, I have. Please? I've actually met with them on probably whew, eight or 12 occasions. And uh, every time we meet, it's the same, basically the same issue. They have complaints against this company. And all these allegations are outside this project until this, this evening. So um, I just want to make sure that they understand our position in their own language. Yes. So if you, I, I can certainly do that. To address it that way. Can I ask a simple question? Yes. 
the people that have been speaking to you from Great, West, Great Western, are they current employees? I couldn't understand our daughter. A current employee? Okay. What's the combination? So they're current, not, not, I don't want to say disgruntled past employees, but, but they are current employees. That's my question. Mayor Council Member Osborne. It's a combination of uh, former employees and current employees, as well as ASE students and others that have not identified themselves. Okay, thank you. Vice Mayor, if I, if I may, I mean, I, it's not criticism. Tell me if I'm getting out of line here, but just a bit of advice. Y'all visited me unannounced at my place of business in the middle of the work day and interrupted a discussion I was having with a client, and I will tell you, um, work through Raul, work through our city process, and you won't find a whole lot of sympathy when you interrupt folks in the middle of their workday outside of City Hall, which is your proper public venue for those discussions. I have one question. Is this a union issue? Mr. Mr. Mayor, I think we're, oh, sorry. we better stop. <laughs> okay, thank you. Raul, why don't you offer to take them out right now rather than wait to the end of the meeting and talk to them? Because they probably don't want to. Mayor, council members, I just spoke with them before the meeting to kind of get a heads up of what they're going to bring up to the council. And I reiterated the fact that the city cannot get in between the, the issues they have with their company. And I also reiterated the fact that we cannot be a mediator between them and Great Western directors. Uh, and that's when they uh, came up with the issue that, hey, there is something going on at the site at this time. And again, that was something new to our department. So again, did tell them that uh, we're going to go ahead and investigate. If there's any issues, we'll correct them. If it's a safety issue, obviously, uh, we'll talk to the contractor as well as Barton Mello. But you mentioned that you were going to talk to them after the meeting. I will address the uh, the concern regarding, I guess, your just okay. iterating the fact that uh, right. we can't do anything. If you do that at yours and their convenience, that would be helpful, I think. Yes, I will. Okay. Do we have any other? Comments from the public on non-agenda items. Okay, ask the city clerk to read the consent items A and B by title only, please. Item A, approved draft minutes of the February 11, 2008 work session, regular council meeting, and special meeting. Item B, request for mayor and council to accept and approve the proposal to provide audit services for the next three fiscal years for the city of Goodyear submitted by Henry and Horn, LLC, and authorize the city manager to execute the necessary contracts. Okay, thank you. Would anyone in the public wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? Would anyone on council wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? Okay, seeing none, uh, could I have a motion and a second, please? Mayor, I move that we accept the consent agenda as read by the city clerk. Second. A motion from Councilmember Cavalier and a second from Councilmember Holland. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Antoniak. Aye. Councilmember Sousa. Aye. Councilmember Cavalier. Aye. Councilmember Lord. Aye. Councilmember Holland. Aye. Councilmember Osborne. Aye. Mayor Kavanaugh. Aye. Passes 7 0. Okay, we'll now move to, we have four items on business. First one is to consider approving a lease between the city and the University of the Incarnate Word. Roy Massey will present. Mayor, members of the council, this is one of the evenings I get to stand in front of you and deliver good news. <laughs> yeah. Well, you usually don't appreciate what I call and say, hey, you got a few minutes. But sometimes it's good. Um, we have been working for, for several months with uh, the, uh, the staff at uh, the University of Incarnate Word to work out a lease agreement for the uh, city center site for a long-term lease with the university to uh, build a our first college campus here in the city. And we're very excited to say that I think uh, Linda Beals put the last and and or in the, uh, the agreement first thing this morning. So hot off the press, I put a lease in front of you. But I'll walk you through the terms. It's a long-term lease. I'll tell you, it was a challenge because you're looking at a uh, use that's a little different than our normal development agreement or short-term type lease where you're talking about a 99-year lease that talks about um, an educational use. So it's a little different. We're, we had a lot of different concepts that we had to get our, our minds around and 
uh, risks we had to evaluate and opportunities and challenges and, and uses and uh, after about three months and a lot of hair pulling I think we got there Cindy Cindy hugged me tonight so I think we're I think we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's good. We were apart, but now we're together. So it was a good negotiation. We met in the middle. Uh, the first thing I will tell you is that the packet you had in front of you, your COAC was wrong. We, we did change it out last Friday, but uh, it's right on the website, but it's wrong in your packet. Um, it talks about an earlier concept we had as far as a lease term. Uh, it is a 99-year lease term, um, and I will walk you through that. So your, your packet is incorrect, but uh, we do have it right on the website. Um, just starting at the beginning, I'll, I'll tell you what the, the site is. And Eddie, I'm going to need Elmo. This is a site that's going to be defined in the lease term as the UIW site. It's a, a 30 acre site, 20 acres, and a 10 acre reserve parcel. 20 acres will be the, the initial development on the part of the university. Uh, with 10 acres, that'll initially be. Uh, developed by the university as a passive recreational area and it will allow for future expansion of the university as, as growth dictates. Uh, we saw this a little bit earlier this evening, um, but that is re that's the site for the university. Uh, it's extending from Estrella Parkway, uh, moving on to the proposed uh, city park uh, that's going to be developed in the future. But that is the site that uh, is being detailed in the university. We, the other university uh, that we haven't in a full-blown negotiation with would be the Franklin Pierce site, and that's the site that's currently anticipated uh, to be reserved for, their, for that university when uh, it comes time to enter that lease. But um, just walking through the, through the term where you have a 99-year lease in front of you, uh, the financial terms that are going to be attached to that lease is a uh, dollar a year for the first 50 years. Uh, we're, we're in partnership here. We're going to do what we can do to, to get this to be a successful venture. And obviously, there's going to be a lot of startup costs, a lot of investment on the part of the university. Uh, our investment is city land. Uh, so that's what we're bringing to the table in, in, this, uh, in this arrangement. Uh, after the first 50 years, uh, rent's going to appreciate to 15%. Uh, of the assessed market value, uh, and then it'll increase an additional 5% each year. And I've been neglectful. I have notes here at the top of my page. I'm going to stop and thank Linda Beals. Uh, she's been crucial in the negotiation of this lease, uh, as well as Jim Nichols and Raul. I just want to recognize the this has been a, a Herculean task uh, to get this put together, and it, their assistance was uh, indispensable, as well as Cindy Porter and Cindy Eskimi on the site of UIW. So didn't want to get to the end and forget them, so now I'll go back to my, my list here. Um, those are the, the standard lease terms. Um, we've also recognized in the lease that uh, there could be occasion where the site doesn't develop as quickly as we all hope and anticipate it's going to develop, and we did enter a letter of intent with the university uh, eight or nine months ago that spelled out that uh, there was a timeline for them to get the campus up and running. And campus is basically going to be uh, putting up some improvement that's going to be operating as a, uh, an institute of higher education. So it'll likely be one building to start and then incrementally will grow from there. And Cindy will probably get up and talk to us here in a few minutes about what their immediate plans are. But there are terms in the, the agreement that deal with the what if, you know, they don't get opened within six years. Uh, rent's going to increase to 50 percent of market value. If they haven't got the campus up and running by the seventh year, we're going to give it 100 percent of market value. Uh, the benefit there is, well, we've, we've incentivized the best we can, but you know, we still want to have them have the benefit of the land, even if it's taken them a little while to get up and running. Uh, but we do start realizing some return on our investment because this is very valuable city property. Um, alternate, there is an alternate three rent in the agreement that if they ever cease operations on the on the land, uh, there is a default provision that they can walk away from the property, and there's some uh, provisions on how we deal with the improvements on that property if that happens. There's also an al alternative there that if they want to just hold the property for some amount of time while they're um, ceasing operations, that they will pay 100 percent of market value uh, during that time period. Um, we're embarking on a due diligence period. Uh, during this due diligence period, uh, the city is going to be providing environmental assessments to UIW on the site. Um, we're going to be providing title reports. 
Uh, UIW is going to be conducting site assessments, uh, surveying the site, uh, starting the permitting process on the various buildings, the infrastructure improvements they're going to put on the site. Uh, the site hasn't been zoned, uh, so the site uh, that's, as we all know, it takes a while to get a piece of land zoned here in the city. What we have agreed to do in this uh, lease agreement is we're basically in the process of putting together our city center PAD, uh, and we've agreed to include this site as part of that PAD process. So we're actually going to do the zoning on that. Um, there are there are some conditions precedent, um, i.e., conditions the city does need to meet prior to the lease uh, being fully effective, and one is uh, a library uh, in the future. The condition present to this lease is we are going to have a library and they're going to have access to that library. Certainly that's something that's in the planning stages. We all anticipate that that's going to be open and up and running by the time that the campus comes into being. But that is a condition present. I will make you aware of that, that that is in the lease. Uh, improvements on the land, UIW is responsible for financing and constructing all the improvements on the land and all the associated infrastructure, both on-site and off-site. Uh, UIW will own all the improvements on the land. Uh, this, this is a ground lease. We're giving them vacant land, and they're going to build their campus. Um, they will file annual, annual statements with the city, uh, let us know each and every improvement they put on that land uh, for the next 99 years. That's in excess of $10,000 value, so we have some knowledge and of what's going on in our land. Um, again, we're not obligated to contribute to either on-site or off-site infrastructure. Uh, there are subleasing provisions, uh, but only with the city's approval, i.e. they can't go out and lease off parts of the property without our agreement. And those subleases need to be consistent with the use that's in, envisioned for the property, so it would be academic type uses. Now, they can enter vendor type leases um, for like the bookstore or the cafeteria, or those types of services. Those, uh, they're, they're not subleases, but they're vendor contracts, and those types of activities are permitted on the property. But they will be providing the city copies of those um, contracts on a, on a timely basis. Um, there's a general indemnity provision that uh, basically they're indemnifying the city for liability that occurs on their land. Um, uh, for the most part, it's a little bit different on the passive uh, recreational area, that 10-acre 10, 10 reserve parcels. Basically, the agreement is until such time as they've undertaken an, an academic use on that parcel, that's going to be opened up as a general recreation area You know, that can be used by the general public. So uh, that just has a negligence provision on whoever is negligent in any liability. This is lawyer stuff. If, tell, give me the move along when we start uh, getting down into the boilerplate. I, I can get the, get the hints. You know, I get to the exciting stuff. Um, one, the one issue we had to kind of wrestle with was, you know, this is a 99-year lease. I'm certainly not going to be around to worry about what happens at the end of this 99-year lease, and uh, absent great advances in medical science. But we do like to at least put in some provisions on what are we going to do at the end of this lease. Uh, we do need to worry about that because there are going to be future councils. Certainly, uh, at that time, everyone, the only thing they've ever going to have known at this piece of property was that, well, that's UIW. They probably won't even know they have a lease on this property, but we need to address it. Uh, what we've done is put a right of first proposal in there for an additional 50-year term. Um, so UIW, at the end of 99 years, will be able to come back in and propose an additional 50-year term lease, and there is a cap on that of 50% market value. And the alternative, if we are not able to... Uh, reach an agreement for an extension of the lease at that time, or in the event that there's a default in the meantime, for whatever reason, uh, there's a default, which the only def real default on the part of UIW would be not having a campus in operation um, the majority of, of the year. Uh, their remedy is basically to walk away. Uh, at that point, the city as the landlords would step back in and uh, re uh, take the property. But we had to deal with what are we going to do with the improvements. Um, as I stated, UIW is uh, contemplated to put in a major investment in improvements, and uh, I'm not going to say what we speculate that those will be, but you know, buildings are expensive. And if they're going to leave the property and the city's going to take over those improvements and use them to the city's benefit, then uh, it's reasonable that UIW should be at least partially compensated for the investment they've made in that property. So what we've agreed to is the city will pay up to one half cost of the actual construction costs of those improvements or five million dollars whatever's less so 
it's, it's probably that's probably not actually half of what they're going to be putting into their initial investment, but at least they uh, recoup some of their investment if they do have to leave for whatever reason that may be. Uh, let's see here. Um, there will be a resident and employee discount uh, for students that are attending the university. If you're a City of Goodyear resident, uh, you will receive a 15% discount off of the normal tuition rates. So that will certainly be a benefit to our, uh, our citizens. <laughs> there are joint use provisions, and I just highlight that um, both parties at the table do envision that in the future, uh, in our city center, there's going to be a library, there's going to be ballpark and other recreational type facilities, or maybe a performing arts center. And we all agree that in the future we're going to uh, enter the discussion so that they're going to have access uh, to those facilities. And uh, those will be both a benefit to the city and a benefit to the university. Um, signage, we have a signage provision that uh, the uh, UIW is going to incorporate uh, the words Goodyear or the city logo in all of their signage and all of their advertisements for the university uh, to help advertise the city and, and where it's located. And uh, with that, those are the major terms of the, uh, the agreement. And I'll answer any questions you may have. Would you like to speak? Like to speak? <laughs> Would you like to talk? <laughs> <laughs> mm. I just want to tell you all how excited we are. All right, this has been, it seems like it was a whole lot longer than three months, I want to let you know. All right, I've learned more about leases than I ever care to learn about leases. Um, and, and hopefully I won't ever have to do this again. But I want to tell you that this um, is very exciting to UIW. All right, we're, we're prepared now as soon as we get this out of the way to move full speed ahead. All right, the first thing we'll be doing is releasing an RFP for a fundraising council. All right, we've um, already received some commitments for fundraising at this point, but we're going to go ahead and do that RFP and get something in place so we can start raising money right away. All right, as you know, that we're in our third term all right, with our adult programs. All right, things are going quite well. Um, we are also looking to expand down into Phoenix. We had a meeting today to talk with um, St. Mary's, the high school. So we'll also be doing a site there as well, which is going to help us to build the brand. All right, the more that we can get out there about the University of the Incarnate Word and what we mean to the citizens of not only Goodyear in the West Valley, but also all of Arizona being the first Catholic university to have a physical presence, all right, the better. All right, as that moves forward, I want you to know that as soon as the fundraising is put to bed and we start to build, all right, very rapidly we plan at full build out to have 3,000 students resident here in Goodyear. All right, so it's a very exciting time for us, and I just want to tell you all how happy we are and what good friends you all are. Thank you, and we look forward to being good citizens here in Goodyear. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. I think a round of applause is doing yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the opportunity for citizens, public, anyone wish to comment. I may have one clarification. Sure. Just may have That's Pardon me? There's two of us here from the University of the Incarnate Word. My name is Dr. Cindy Wilson Porter. I'm soon to be the Vice President of Extended Academic Programs. Behind me is Vince Porter. He's the Dean of the School of Extended Studies. He's in charge of the adult program that we have operating out here in Arizona currently. And the residents of San Antonio. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I may have made one uh, misstatement. Um, and if I did, I apologize. Uh, it's ninety. It's a dollar a year for the first fifty years. It accelerates fifty percent of market, fifteen percent of market value. Then every ten years, that fifteen percent goes up five percent. I wasn't clear. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. Seems like it was a pretty fast escalator there. Did I say every year. Yes, yeah. you did. Yeah. I was counting. Cindy better read her contract. Fifty-five years. Pretty good deal. They were very quiet. The contract. Right. Okay, so could I have a motion, please, to approve the lease agreement? Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve a lease agreement between the University of Incarnate Word, a Texas nonprofit corporation, and the city of Goodyear for the terms as described by our attorney. I'll oh, second that. Oh, do you have a resolution? We have a resolution. Pardon me. We need to read the resolution first. Sorry, that wasn't <laughs> 
08-1218, approving and authorizing the mayor to execute a lease agreement with the University of the Incarnate Word for the development of a four-year institute of higher education campus within the city of Goodyear City Center, authorizing and directing the mayor to take all actions and execute all documents necessary to carry out the lease and providing for an effective date. With that, Mr. Mayor, I would move that we adopt Resolution 08-1218 as read by the clerk. And I second it. The motion from Vice Mayor Antoniak and a second from Council Member Cavalier. Discussion? I, Vice Mayor? A couple of comments. You know, it's, it's an exciting day for us, obviously, and, and hopefully we'll have another one coming shortly in front of us in the, in the near future. But, you know, just a, a little anecdotal. I... Um, First step, camp, first step foot on UIW's campus when I was 10 years old and was brought out there because my mother graduated from this university. And, uh, oh it's an exciting, it's an exciting time to be thinking that maybe my, her granddaughter could be going to the very same institution right here within our, the confines of our city. That way, I can keep a closer eye on her while she's going through her <laughs> higher education <laughs> degree. So, um, but. It's a very, very, very exciting times, and uh, I look forward to the successes that both institutions will bring uh, to, to uh, Goodyear and Mayor. Hopefully, when you sign this one tomorrow, it will be one of your more uh, prouder moments initiating this thought process on us almost four years ago now, three and a half years, three years ago, I think. So, um, it's exciting times. But thank you for everybody's participation. I know it has been a long road. Just like to say officially, welcome aboard. Thank you. Okay, could I have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Sousa? Aye. Councilmember Cavalier? Aye. Councilmember Lord? Aye. Councilmember Holland? Aye. Councilmember Osborne? Aye. Vice Mayor Antonia? Aye. Mayor Cavanaugh? Aye. Passes 7 0. All right. Okay, now we'll move to a uh, consider approving a contract with the Gila River Indian community for a 100 year lease of surface water. Dave Iwanski. Mayor, members of the council, good evening. In December of uh, 2005, President Bush signed into law the Arizona Water Settlement Act, which had overwhelming approval in the United States Congress. In December of 2005, this mayor and council also passed two resolutions which authorized the city to participate in this historic settlement. The single largest benefit of this agreement is that the city will be acquiring an additional 14,200 11 acre feet of new CAP and Indian lease water. For the past two years, all of the implementation provisions have been negotiated, and Secretary of Interior Kim Thorne signed the final record of decision in December of 2007. In your original approval and authorization, you approved a $10 million lump sum settlement for the lease. Due to budgetary constraints, staff is now recommending that the city approve a 15-year annual installment option, approximately $856,000 a year. This annual payment is, um, is adjusted using consumer price index uh, methodology. The city also has the ability to either sublease or assign on an interim basis its leased water to recoup full cost recovery for any future payments made. This is a budgeted item. We do approve recommend, um, recommending approval, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you. Uh, comments from the public? Could I have a motion to approve the lease, please, Mr. Mayor? I move to council approve a contract with the Gila River Indian community for, for 15 annual payments for the 100-year lease of service water rights and authorize the city manager to execute all documents. The initial payment will be $855,572.67. Six, Big figure. Thank you. We have a motion from Council Member Susan, a second from Vice Mayor Antoniak. It's open for discussion. Mr. Mayor? I might add to what uh, David had said. This is a long time coming. A lot of negotiations, particularly uh, in Washington and locally. Uh, it gives this community a tremendous amount of draw on future water necessities. Uh, 
Senator Kyle was heavily instrumental in arranging this agreement. It wasn't easy. It was back and forth, back and forth for a year in the finalized with the contract that we got by going in concert with other communities who are part of this agreement. So uh, it's good that we got it, and it's for the future of this city and cities in Arizona in general. Um, Mayor, Council Member Sousa, well said, and the city has uh, conveyed its appreciation to both Senator Kyle and the governor of the Gila River Indian community. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Just a, uh, you, you said 14,000. I know that's what we're, that's the total from the Gila River, but this agreement is for seven, right? Uh, the lease itself, uh, Mayor, is 7,000 acre okay. feet per year for 100 years. Okay, and then it's, uh, I'm really not sure I understand, 15 years, do you re renegotiate the number, the price? No, Mayor, that 15-year installment plan will be payment in full for the entire 100-year lease. So, at, okay, at, boy, at 15 years in 20... <laughs> 23. Uh, we, our lease will be paid in full, Mayor. All right. Boy, that's good news. That yeah, is good. It is. This, this is one important thing for the future residents of this city, I'll tell you. Yes, sir. Okay. All those in favor of the motion signify by stating aye. 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 Opposed? Nice to have it 7 0. Thank you. Okay, now we'll move to uh, Tracy. Are you going to do C and D together or you want to do one first? We knew them together? together. Okay, so I'll let you start. Thank you. Okay. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to adopt an infrastructure improvements plan. Cindy, could you put that microphone down a little bit? A little. I can't quite hear you. Though. Okay. Sorry. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to adopt an infrastructure improvements plan, adopt a notice of intent to adjust development impact fees, and to set a date for a public hearing, the date of May 19th, 2008. Due to the change in Arizona law, the calculation of impact fees now includes an infrastructure improvement plan. This plan provides for expected future infrastructure needs of the city for a specific time frame. The consultants um, calculated the maximum allowable fees that are assessed by the city based on the plan. A copy of the consultant's report is on file with the city clerk's office. In 1995, the city of Goodyear adopted utility impact fees. In 2002, the city of Goodyear adopted non-utility impact fees. The current development fees were adopted in December of 2006 amid developer concerns. Because of those concerns, the City Council asked staff to continue working with developers to complete an EDU study and a development impact fee study. We have done that, and tonight we are going to um, present the report to the City Council. If Council adopts the Notice of Intent, on May 19th a public hearing will be held, and Council and Mayor will have the opportunity to hear from the stakeholders. On June 23rd, the Council will then consider adoption of the proposed impact fees. The consultants Paul Tischler and Chris Cullinan from Tischler Bice will give a brief presentation of the report. With Council's permission, the presentation will also include the next item on the agenda, which deals with the Snow Rain Valley impact fees. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, members of the council, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to start off this presentation and then Chris is going to take over showing you the summary fee schedules. Um, topics as you can see there are what are the development fee requirements. There are requirements not only in the State Act but also from Supreme Court requirements. We're going to talk about the methodologies fairly briefly. And then Chris is going to take you through the infrastructure categories, the components of those categories, and then the different methodologies, uh, summarizing the methodologies that we did use. Uh, you'll see tables which show the total fee amounts for both the city and then the Sonoran Valley. And of course, be glad to answer any questions that you might have at the end of that. Um, let's talk first about 
the constitutional requirements, which rational nexus, what does that mean? We have to, you have to show a need. Well, obviously the city's growing and you do need additional capacity for infrastructure. The proportionality, what does that mean? That means that we can't charge new growth for a Cadillac when you're only offering the Chevrolet. So you will see throughout our report, by the way, which is, I think, 170 pages, uh, there are a bunch of tables. You're only going to see the very a few tables today, the summary <laughs> tables. Um, we do define the level of service so that make sure that we, re the, we achieve the proportionality requirement. And then the benefit requirement. That's the rational nexus issue in terms of if I pay you the fee, there should be a benefit I derive. And uh, as Chris will talk to you about in just a few minutes, there is one geographic sub-area that varies for one of the um, roads, road categories. The uh, state, as you may know, has its own act, own requirements, uh, but they basically require the same things I just went over. Uh, the m must be a reasonable relationship to the burden imposed. Uh, you have to offset the cost. Now remember, the fees are only new growth's fair share of capital costs. They have nothing to do with your operating expenses, which of course is most of your burden. And they have nothing to do with normal rehabilitation and retrofit. We're talking about capacity expansion. And before I go further, I, I do want to thank Larry and the staff. Uh, Tracy, she's been a real tiger in getting this thing with all these disparate elements together. And of course, uh, the data is as good as we can obtain and verify ourselves. So they've done a yeoman job to bring us to tonight. Um, by the way, we also, I should tell you, have done over 700, prepared over 700 fees around the country and have uh, conducted most of the fee assignments in Arizona. So we're quite confident that at the end of the day, you will have a very defensible fee structure. And uh, none of our fees have ever go gone to court. The uh, last point of that slide talks about the Infrastructure Improvement Plan, the IIP. And this is a fairly recent requirement of the Act, and it requires that you estimate the future necessary public services that will be required as a result of the new development and forecast the cost of the infrastructure. And you will note within our report that there is a separate IIP for each component. There are the three methodologies. The buy-in, which is where you are, it's like a cost recovery. You already have the facility established. The sewer treatment plant could be an example of that. So new growth is paying you its fair share. To re you're recapturing the monies. The other two methodologies are the usual ones you'll see in our study. The incremental expansion, that is where we define the current level of service. And we've costed it out, and new growth is going to pay you that current, that amount so that you will be able to maintain that current level of service of capital facilities. The um, plan-based approach is based on something which is in your CIP or will be in your CIP, and new growth is going to pay its fair share. You can see that the marginal approach versus the average approach, Chris will show you for some roads, the marginal approach is where if you didn't have any more growth, you wouldn't build that, those roads. So new growth is going to pay its fair share of the total cost of those roads um, based on a trip basis. And then the average cost approach is where there are more benefit, benefits to both through travel, existing trips, as well as new trips. So we've looked at all three methodologies and um, have utilized the most appropriate one. In some cases, we previously met with staff to go over the alternatives. And what you see tonight is our recommendation of the approaches. Now, there are 12 categories. You can see the first ones relate to utilities. The other are general fund. And the uh, regional transportation is where you'll find that there is a differential uh, for between service area. And I'm going to let Chris now go over and show you the category and then the specific approach used. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, again, my name is Chris Cullinan. I'm the primary author of the city's development fee study. Uh, as Paul mentioned, these next couple of slides just uh, illustrate uh, not only the fee categories themselves, but what exactly is contained within each one of those fees. A little bit more uh, description about the methodologies that we used, how it's assessed, 
And as you see on this slide, these are the utility fees, and they're assessed based on the water meter size. Um, for water, we include things like the water development projects, support assets and infrastructure, water resources projects. Uh, under wastewater, we have treatment, collection, uh, the support assets associated with, uh, with that infrastructure, and then the reclaimed water projects there at the bottom. And in the column on the, uh, on the right, it talks a little bit about the methodologies that were used. As Paul mentioned, we have uh, three methodologies to determine what's new development um, demand for additional infrastructure. And so it's a mix depending on the infrastructure uh, category. Uh, for example, in treatment, use the, the plan-based approach, whereas for support vehicles, it's the incremental approach just because those uh, different types of infrastructure have different capacities. And so uh, we want to uh, ensure that new development is paying its proportionate share, again, meeting those legal requirements. On this page, we have uh, the public safety-related uh, development fees for fire and police, as well as public works on the bottom. And these are assessed uh, both, get, both against both residential and non-residential uh, development. Uh, police and fire include many of the similar facilities since uh, those two departments share a lot of uh, the infrastructure, such as administration, uh, stations, the training facility. Uh, under fire, we include apparatus and equipment. Police, we have vehicles and communications equipment. Under public works, uh, the public works corporate yard is certainly the biggest project in that overall fee. Uh, under the vehicles, we include more of what I would call the administrative sort of uh, departments in public works, engineering, administration, ones that serve uh, a variety of different uh, a variety of different inf infrastructure categories. Vehicles and equipment associated with utilities are in the utility fees. Transportation-related vehicles are in transportation. Uh, these really reflect uh, vehicles that serve a variety of different needs, but not necessarily uh, one single one. Uh, general government, uh, again, is assessed against both residential and non-residential development. Biggest component of that being the planned city center project, as well as, again, general government vehicles, again, more of uh, the vehicles that serve the, the entire municipal organization rather than one discrete department. Uh, as Paul mentioned, um, when we get to transportation, we sort of have, we have two sets of fees. Uh, one what we're calling citywide for uh, for lack of a better term, sort of the traditional boundaries of the city, and then Sonoran Valley, the recently annexed uh, areas to the south. Um, the categories are, have the same titles, but they're a little bit different. Uh, under arterial streets, under the citywide, we do include a buy-in component for uh, roads that were oversized in anticipation of new development. As new development comes, it'll pay you back for using up that available capacity. We obviously don't have that uh, in Sonoran Valley yet. Um, under the regional transportation uh, category for the citywide fees, we have the Cotton Lane Bridge Project. And we're recommending actually two zones, one north of the Gila River and one south of the Gila River. There's a fee differential because of different demand uh, for that particular piece of infrastructure and different, uh, different benefits of that as well. Again, going back to those rational nexus requirements uh, uh, informed how we should set up that zone or whether we should set up that zone or not. Interrupt there. That, yes, sir. In the last year, that was a significant difference on the Cotton Lane Bridge. Yes. Is it again this year? Uh, when we get to the summary slide, uh, I believe for a single family house, it's a couple of hundred dollars. Uh, for commercial, it's a few dollars a square foot. Uh, so when you say significant, I'm not sure what order of magnitude that is, but there is a difference, and that's that's the big difference for the citywide fees north and south of the rivers, is, is that one component. Um, for Sonoran Valley, uh, the Rainbow Valley Road Extension uh, is the project that's in that regional uh, transportation fee, and that's just for the Sonoran Valley area. And so we've got a couple of summary tables here of the different fee, uh, fee categories and different parts of the city where those are being assessed. These first couple of slides are going to deal with uh, the citywide uh, fees. What you see here are the utility development fees for water, water resources, wastewater, Reclaimed water, and again, it's based on the size of the water meter, and then uh, it's indexed using different capacity ratios as to how much water is actually being used and the uh, required infrastructure to provide that. Um, this is north of the Gila River for these citywide fees. I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail, but just to orient you maybe a little bit towards uh, this table, because the other tables are very similar to it. Uh, we have residential development at the top there. Residential development fees are assessed on a per unit basis. Uh, down below, we have the non-residential categories. Uh, with the exception of hotels, 
They're assessed on a per square foot basis. Hotels are on a per bed basis. Um, at the top of that non-residential section, you see the commercial and shopping center uh, type of development with different size thresholds. Office institutional land uses are in the middle. The industrial flex sort of land uses are there at the bottom. And so we have library, parks, and rec, as you see, are being assessed against just residential development only. And then fire, police, public works, general government, arterial streets, and the regional transportation uh, fee. So point of reference to the mayor's comment, uh, for north of the Gila River, it's $61. Uh, for a single-family attached house. Uh, we jump over to south of the river, and uh, if my eyesight doesn't fail me, I believe that's 439 uh, per house. So there is a pretty significant difference uh, between the two. And again, these are all, all the fee categories, all the amounts are the same north and south of the river, with the exception of that regional transportation fee. Toggle back and forth again there. Uh, okay. Uh, oops, went too far. Uh, for the Sonoran Valley area, uh, we're recommending two fee zones in that area. One uh, pertains to the Amaranth development, and then one that we're calling Sonoran Valley for the non-Amaranth uh, areas of the Sonoran Valley. Uh, we have differentials for uh, the utility fees here, and the biggest differential is uh, for the Sonoran Valley piece, we include the financing cost. If the city were have to, get to go in, and uh, provide that infrastructure right away. Uh, we, we assume more sort of municipal type uh, debt structure. Whereas for Amaranth and talking with the developer and working with city staff, um, any sort of financing alternatives uh, that they further develop as they put that development together are probably not gonna be more, probably not gonna be in line with the traditional municipal structure. And because they're no, unknown at this time, we didn't include those and the developer uh, is on the hook, so to speak, to provide any financing if they do, in fact, proceed before uh, we include those financing costs in their development fee structure. But at this point in time, uh, that's the big difference between those two. State, state that again, so that the developer, so Amaranth is on the hook. What, 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 what we include is what we call uh, a revenue credit, that basically uh, the developer will bring forth uh, either additional revenues or an additional structure or something to, to make up that difference um, in the fees themselves. Um, so that those financing costs, again, we wanted to include the financing costs on the non-Amaranth portions for places where the city is actually gonna be the infrastructure provider um, and not make those same assumptions that some other entity or some other financing arrangement would come forward and said include those in the development fees. So that's really, so those are sort of the discussions that we had as, in terms of setting up these fees for the Sonoran Valley area. Uh, for the Sonoran Valley uh, section, uh, again, the same fee categories as we have in the citywide fees. Uh, different amounts for the arterial streets and the regional transportation because, again, the costs uh, are a little bit different. Uh, forecasted to be uh, different in that part of the city versus uh, the citywide or the traditional part of the city. And for the Amaranth comp uh, portion of that, uh, the difference between these sets of fees are, again, the arterial streets and the, re uh, the regional, or actually regional transportation is saying the arterial streets is different. Same thing, uh, we didn't include the financing costs uh, for the Amaranth portion of the arterial streets where that is included uh, in the Sonoran Valley piece. Um, probably this, is, this might be the slide that's probably the easiest to see. A uh, comparison of the different fee zones and the total fee paid. And the idea here is, you see, we have uh, a residential example using a single-family attached house with a three-quarter inch water meter. Uh, commercial example below that, office, light, industrial. And what this is, is if someone were to walk into the door and ask for a permit and this was their development configuration, here's the total fee that they would pay based on the water meter size, the square footage, the type of development, that sort of thing. And so we have there the citywide north of the river, north of the Gila River and south of the Gila River and then the two Sonoran Valley zones for the Sonoran Valley and the Amaranth portion uh, as well. So this is probably the most concise uh, slide showing the differences. Uh, the timeline, Tracy uh, talked about this in her introductory remarks. Um, should know we had a meeting, a liaison committee meeting with the development community last week. Uh, it was about a two hour meeting, uh, it was a lot of uh, a lot of us talking, giving a presentation, and walking those folks through the details. Um, but there's also a lot of question and answer and a lot of good give and take. Um, I think we answered some questions. Uh, some questions we're still working on, and we're working with staff right now to resolve those 
and uh, hopefully we'll get answers back within the week on those outstanding issues. Uh, here we are tonight, March 3rd, begins the notice of intent. Uh, as you see laid out here, and as Tracy mentioned, this is, uh, this is all per state law. Uh, this is when state law kicks in in terms of the timing of how, how you go forward from here in terms of the notice of intent tonight, 60 days until uh, the first opportunity for a public hearing, uh, another 30 days before the first opportunity for adoption, and that's another 75 days after that that the new fees would go into effect. You can still collect the old fees, but 75 days before these new ones would go into effect, uh, whatever uh, amount is ultimately adopted. And uh, that concludes our presentation. Thank you. Okay. It's a lot to absorb. <laughs> well, hopefully it's a, it's, it's a bit more concise than uh, 170 pages. Can you move the timeline slide back up here? Yes, sir. Talking questions. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, do we have any comments from the public? I know we will when we get the public hearing. <laughs> okay, uh, so we should do each of these uh, separately now. We'll do the notice of intention to adjust utility and non-utility impact fees and adopt infrastructure improvements plans, but not for the Sonoran Valley here. Okay. So could I have a motion to approve on C? Mr. Mayor, I move that the council to adopt the notice of intention to adjust utility and non-utility development impact fees and adopt an infrastructure improvement plan and set May 19, 2008 as the date of the public hearing. So moved. Second. The motion. Councilmember Susan, a second from Councilmember Lord. It's open for discussion. Councilmember Susan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What type of resistance do you expect uh, from uh, the development community? Well, you made up the fees, so let me know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I anticipate resistance. <laughs> um, you know, the notice of intent period is its exactly what it's designed to do. It's an opportunity for the public, you know, certainly average citizens, but also the development community to, uh, to review the fees, uh, review the methodologies. Uh, the city's gone the extra step of having that liaison committee, which is not required in state law, but certainly something we recommend. I think it's something very successful in uh, at least discussing the technical aspects of the fee report. The, the, those forums, uh, you know, aren't the forums to really discuss the merits of the fees. That's your purview. Um, but we try to walk them through as much of the technical information and the assumptions as possible. We may not get agreement, uh, but certainly we, we do value their comments and take them very seriously and we'll answer them to the extent that we can. But uh, at the end of the day, we may have to agree to disagree and then certainly uh, uh, any concerns or questions uh, will certainly be brought forth for this body. Uh, what we've shown you is, as I mentioned earlier, new growths, fair share of capital facilities. So to the extent you decide to impose less than 100 percent of these <coughs> maximum defensible fees, then one of two things will happen. Either your level of service for everybody here, as well as new growth, will go down because you don't have sufficient monies, or you will have to come up with additional revenue sources. Um, the other point is, as Chris said, there'll be public hearing. I think what you're going to hear is that it's going to be an additional cost that will be added on to the house. Uh, generally, that's going to be true. And so the policy decision is going to be who should pay for New growth, fair share of capital facilities. Should new growth pay that or not? Now, there is, of course, a soft market right now. There's a uh, overhang of inventory for housing, and um, my suspicion is that for the next year or so, if you, from what you read, there would not be all that many new units built. So I think one of the questions you'll have is: Look, the people are going to be paying these development fees will be for new housing that's going to be coming out when the market's recalibrated itself. It's not for those folks with the overhang today. They've already paid their fees. But again, it will be a policy issue for you folks. Okay, thank you. Okay, all those in favor of the motion, signify by stating aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. 7-0. Mayor? 
Excuse me. I don't think it's on your script, but you also need a motion to set May 19th as the date for the public hearing. I don't believe that was included. It wasn't included in it? Okay. Is that all right? Fix that in the motion. It's down here. It's under number three in item B. Okay. And the same thing would be in the next one? Okay. Now, any comments from the public on the Sonoran Valley? Seeing none, could I have a motion then on D? Okay, I'll go ahead. Let the council adopt a notice of intention to assess utility and non-utility development impact fees and an infrastructure improvements plan for the Sonoran Valley area and set May 19th, 2008 as the date for a public hearing. Second. Motion from Council Member Susan and a second from Vice Mayor Antoniak. It's open for discussion. And the schedule, I should say, is the schedule meeting should appear also. Is that what you want? Okay. Okay. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Yes, I have it. We now move to information items, comments, reports on current events by Mayor and Council Members. Council Member Lord. Yeah, I just want to mention that we have a tech at the elementary school in Sonoran to install a new video equipment on March 5th. So, you know, they complained about the screen being too small, and so that's going to be taken care of. And I thank Kathy Fernandez, the Director of Information and Technology Service, for that. Okay, thank you. Council Member Susan. That meeting, bi-monthly meeting, is a historic good year. We went over a plan to include signage on top of existing street signs, identifying various areas as historic good year with a symbol of a lighter than air ship in the center of the name. They're going to come forward and meet with the Council probably next month, and that presentation will be made at that time by staff. And we've invited the historic good year folks to be in attendance at that meeting to get input as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council Member Hall. I just wanted to mention that this morning we were at the grand opening of the Palm Valley 303 complex, and it was really an exciting venture. I'm so sorry that everybody couldn't be there. It was different by having the racing school come in and put their carts out, and the guys put on their hood socks, learning the lingo, and their helmets, and it was just fun to see it all. We had a good lunch, and we had a lot of city folks attend, and I thought that was really important to them because they mentioned it several times after the presentation. So it was a lot of fun. Three council members were there. Thank you. And one couldn't find his way. And one would have been there. Okay. Manager, summary of events and reports. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, no reports. I do have a couple of follow-up items. First is we'll have several items associated with the Performing Arts Center. We'll be working closely with the proposers, and we'll keep council informed as far as what we come up with. The second item is I got an email from Mr. Varela, and that's he did have a chance to meet with Great Western employees after the first part of the council meeting, and they are alleging some poor and unsafe working conditions. So what we've asked them to do, we are going to contact Barton Mallow, the general contractor, let them know of the concerns. We'll ask Barton Mallow to work directly with Great Western and address those. But we'll stay in the loop on it, but we're not truly fixing it, but we're going to definitely follow up with the general contractor. Good response. Thank you, and thanks to Mr. Varela. That's all I have. Okay. Opportunity for council to ask questions of staff. Meeting is adjourned.